with R.D. Dykeman, and I want to welcome you to a new segment, which is our Diabetes Champions segment. Excited to talk to you today all about your journey uh, with diabetes. Thanks, Brian. Good to be here. Yeah, so this is, uh, we've had you on the Diabetes Summit before, which uh, you gave a really popular talk, and as we were just talking here before, I think we're going to uh, do need to do a full podcast episode too because we have a lot to talk about. But today, I really want to focus on uh, your family's journey with diabetes. So uh, maybe you can uh, just share uh, the story, uh, if you will, about diagnosis and maybe right. uh, how you uh, kind of came to learn what you now apply uh, for for uh, for diabetes and blood sugar control. Right, right. Uh, sure. Uh, I think our diagnosis story was pretty typical. And um, like most people, we were totally unprepared and lacked any knowledge of what diabetes was, let alone you know, the differences between type 1 or type 2 or, um, uh, you know, what, what I, I've seen like a TV show with diabetics eating, you know, a piece of candy. I, I, that's all I knew. Mm -hmm. um, so when Dave was diagnosed, uh, he was in severe life-threatening DKA. And um, we were told by his pediatrician that he was, he had the flu and to, uh, he was losing weight. So to give him a lot of milkshakes. So we did, you know, we're good parents. So we, mm -hmm. we went to the doctor and we gave him, uh, but he, he just rapidly deteriorated, Brian. And the, the kind of the, the heartbreaking point of that was when, um, uh, this was during March Madness. He stayed from home from school. We were watching uh, basketball games. And he was so hungry and uh, so thirsty, and I, which was good, right? Because he was losing weight, but he, he was eating. So, and he he threw up uh, right after he ate. And um, I he said, "I can't get to the bathroom." And uh, I picked him up, and. Um, I carried him to the bathroom and he was like light as a feather and he's nine at that point. Mm. And I, he couldn't lift his arms to take his shirt off to get himself cleaned up. And I pulled his shirt up and it looked like skin and bones. And it, and cause I had not seen him with the shirt off for a few days and that's how fast it strikes. He probably lost 15 pounds in, in 48 hours, something like that. Wow. It was the worst moment of my life, man. And talking about this, like I can't get over it when I talk about what it was like because I put myself there. And I looked at him. I called my wife. I said, Roxanne, Dave is going to die. We took him to the hospital or took him to the doctor that day. And the damn pediatrician said, give him milkshakes. He's going to be fine. He's got the flu. We did that for 24 hours. And um, I took him to the uh, emergency room and they did a test on him and they said he's a type one diabetic and he's in severe DK. And how old was he at that point? He was nine and he's 14. Oh, yeah. yeah. So this is five years ago. Yeah, man. Not an I unusual mean, story. You're right. You're right. I've, I've heard too many stories like that. And, um, man, that's gotta be scary. You know, I've got a, uh, 17 year old son now. And um, I, I just can't imagine watching that and experiencing that for, for uh, you know, these, this kid that you, is your whole world, you know. It's got to be uh, incredibly scary and painful. Well, the, the, the fear uh, was only beginning because, uh, uh, you know, when we learned, when I, of course, you start trying to learn right away. And when you learn about the life, the typical life and outcomes that um, these kids and adults face, uh, it's, it's incredibly scary. And uh, our, our endocrinologist who we immediately met with pulled no punches um, about what the outcomes would be unless things were, um, unless he properly took care of himself. He didn't, he didn't teach us how to take care of him. But uh, not really. But um, um, he he warned us that uh, that the situation was grave. Uh, the short term fears were gone, but then the long term worries started. And um, 
what happened next was also uh, incredibly typical. We met with a provider team, including a dietitian, our CDE, mm -hmm. and um, we discussed food and insulin. And the food recommendations were, and everyone knows by now that I'm a low carb advocate, um, but the initial food uh, was high carb, uh, oatmeal, eat what you want, uh, cover with insulin, count the carbs, take the insulin. And um, man, I'm like, I'm like, a, I'm a theoretical physicist and I work kind of in a signal processing area, which lends itself to thinking about problems like this. And when we took Dave home and tried these methods, uh, it was pretty obvious to me, I tried to do some computer modeling, that it was pretty obvious to me that this is a stochastic process which means it's a random process an unrepeatable process and his blood sugars were 40 to 400 um and it was a disaster right mm -hmm. so that's kind of like what launched me into um into finding alternative methods to the standard um eat what you want and take your insulin strategies which are now pushed on virtually everybody yeah it's incredible. And, and like many, you uh, eventually found Dr. Bernstein's book. And yeah. uh, as it, you know, from an engineering perspective, probably that I'm sure that resonated really well with you from, you know, the, the science and engineering model. And then, uh, you know, I guess you started to apply that and, and low carb diet, but I'm sure there's more to it. So uh, maybe yeah. share a little well. bit more about that. Right. And I can't take, I, I'm the fail in the family as far as discovering Bernstein. My wife was the one, you know, Dave initially at diagnosis, I tell the story all the time, Brian, he was the one when the doctor was explaining to him how to manage his, his numbers, he instantly said, I just won't eat carbohydrate. And we all laughed at him. Uh, because of course you need uh, energy and you need, uh, you know, insulin for growth. So you know, the, the doctor and I just, we, we already knew all the myths or some of the myths, but we tried it for a while. And like, like a lot of people, you know, you'll slip in a, a breakfast of bacon and eggs or something when you, when you just want a damn break, you know, and things will go much easier. And Dave, the whole time, man, he was like, why am I eating all this oatmeal? You know, so now the, the oatmeal thing is like a, a, a dig. Like if I ever assert my parental authority, he just rolls his eyes and goes, ah, you weren't always right, oatmeal. You know, so he knew right off the bat intuitively. And then my wife, when I was doing this computer modeling nonsense and trying to uh, invent a way to give him carbohydrate with, with measurements and, and nonsense, she, she found the book, the Bernstein book. Well, when I got the Bernstein book, in the mail, this is 30 days after diagnosis. Bernstein's got a chapter, early chapter on the law of small numbers, which state that when you use a lot of insulin to cover a lot of carbohydrate, um, you get unpredictable results. And this was exactly the stochastic result I had seen with Dave's measurements and my computer models. Uh, my idea was because I do real-time signal processing, the Department of Defense, I would just build an auto pump for him, like a lot of people are, are thinking that they can, they can get normal blood sugars with a, 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 a closed loop system now. So I thought, well, I'll just do that, right? Because I got, I, got I got a team that can do that. It's not a big deal. And, um, you know, the science did it. Uh, it, didn't, it doesn't work like that. You have to use uh, small doses of of a mild insulin and to cover mostly low rate um, glycemic foods. Uh, protein has a very slow rise. Uh, fibrous vegetables have a very slow rise. You can't match these sharp peaks from carbohydrate with sharp peaks of insulin. You might get it just right every once in a while, but if you're a little off, you're gonna get into trouble and the roller coaster starts. But if you have these real narrow or really wide peaks, you take this, this insulin like regular works like this. Or if, if you want to use a pump, you use multiple doses of fast acting to get effective 
low envelope of insulin. You match that with a low uh, glycemic veggies or, or protein, you can, even if you're off by a little bit, your rise will be so small, you might go up to, and you might want to be at 85 before, during, and after meals. That's the goal. But if you go up to 105 or if you go down to 70, it's so easy to correct your blood sugar. So that's, that's now the game that we play. We use proper nutrition, protein-based nutrition with veggies for micronutrients. We use predictable doses of insulin. And we use other tricks, I'll call them tricks, in the Bernstein book, like splitting basal insulins, et cetera. And uh, Dave's last A1C, we just measured 4.6%, which is an average blood sugar of 85. His glycemic variability is extremely low. He suffers no severe hypoglycemia. He doesn't worry about uh, complications from chronic hypoglycemia. He doesn't suffer from this awful feelings of being up and down all the time. He doesn't have misplaced hunger signals. The whole ball game, man, it's a totally different ball game. Uh, so. Yeah, that's amazing. And, and so, you know, it's, uh, it just, it's got to give you much more peace of mind to be in control like that and to be sort of dictating the process rather than the process dictating uh, you know, your reactions and so forth and trying to always be chasing uh, right. optimal blood sugar levels. So well, look, look at the life of a, an average 14 year old. I got this kid. He's, he's playing now. This is right now. He's playing tackle football and he's on a summer league basketball team for his school and he's on a club basketball team. So literally when I, when he leaves the house, at 6 a.m., I don't see him until 6 p.m. at night. And he's done at, as, you know, a two-and-a-half-hour basketball um, practice and game and a two-hour uh, football game in the hot sun. And he runs normal blood sugars the whole time. And what he'll do is he'll, he'll go over to a CGM in his bag, uh, which is on the sideline, and he'll look. And, and if, he's, if he sees himself, and he'll do that maybe every – half hour, hour, if he sees himself going down, he's got some liquid glucose or some glucose tabs, and he'll take the, the requisite measured amount for that. If he sees himself going high, uh, which can happen in sports, you know, he's very, he's very careful about using insulin during athletics, so he might wait until after. But the highs that he experiences – I mean, look, Dave's, Dave hasn't been above 200 milligrams per deciliter in, I don't know, three years. Wow. I mean, it doesn't happen. And so he might go up to 120 in sports. He might go up to 130 if it's really competitive. But he'll come right back down after practice. Yeah. Um, you know, that's, that's, the sports are like the basic. But the, the point was, there's no fear. Dave is not playing. He does not live in fear. We do not live as parents in fear because if he has a hypoglycemia, he doesn't have 10 units of insulin on board to cover pizza, chips, and candy. Mm -hmm. He has a half unit that he might have gone over because he's had a low-carb cookie or a, a, a piece of chicken or whatever he, you know, the food, we can talk about the foods that he eats, but the 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 hypoglycemic measure for a day that's relevant it's really relevant to everybody is insulin on board during hypoglycemia and that is very small so that's why we don't worry that's why dave goes out during his day and he can manage his own blood sugar and do it relatively easily and stay between let's say uh 75 and 95 um for the whole day that's why his blood sugars are as as a healthy non-diabetic and that's why it's likely that dave is healthier than most of or all of his non-diabetic friends it's all due to this bernstein stuff and we use every little trick in that book that's amazing do you uh i i mean i mean imagine you you obviously still have a physician that you work with do you still work with an endocrinologist or are you just working with a general practitioner internist at this point um, and I, I guess the, the point of my question is I'm curious as to uh, how they sort of uh, 
view what you guys have been able to do right. in the context of what they typically will recommend to most of their most of their patients with diabetes? Well, I think uh, you know Dave has a, a nice relationship with his doctor, so it's not it's not the typical um, situation that most of the people that I know uh, who are trying to to get normal blood sugars and and remove this agony all day long are in. So, um, you know, our meetings with Dave's endocrinologist are mostly about um, getting the right labs for Dave. Um, so, I'll, you know, when, when, you know, we, I like to check Dave's blood glucose to make sure his meter's on, on the money. So I get that. I, I, he finger sticks a number of times during the draw sample, and then we compare the meter. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure his meter is correct while he's in range around 80. That's that's what I'm in, that's what I'm um, looking for. I want to check his vitamin D. I want to check his free T3 for hypothyroid, which is part of the autoimmune cluster. And free T3 is the right thing to check. We check his A1C. Um, so, and then there's so many damn prescriptions, Brian, you know, we got to get his, his basal insulin. We got to get his bolus insulin. We got to get his Dexcom set up. We got to get his syringes by the time. And then he, he measures his growth and all that. Dave's like 99% height and, you know, because he eats well and he's got normal blood sugar. So he's going to grow. By the time we get through all that, there isn't, uh, you know, care providers aren't really paid for their time. They're they're paid for procedures. So he, there's not like a lot of time to get um, philosophic about um, the fact, you know, he, he, he's happy with Dave. He's got probably other patients that he's got bigger issues with. Than Dave. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's oh. just, uh, you know, a lot of doctors have never seen that um, and don't even, right. I don't think realize it's possible. And so it just, it brings, brings uh, to my mind this, it feels like he's either got to sort of just look at Dave as a very, very unique situation. Yeah. 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 Otherwise, uh, I don't know how you could continue to practice the same way. Well, uh, the typical response, which is not uh, from our endocrinologist, but the typical response, and I know enough people bordering into the thousands now. Um, so I can make this statement is that, uh, um, the they the endocrinologist or physician thinks there must be something they've been they've been trained for carb counting they then think that there must be other reasons why this won't work and then and there are so many myths now on the market that they can choose from um to push against parents so if you if you were at the ada meeting uh, mm -hmm. a few days ago um, you, you would have heard, uh, the typical, um, obfuscation by terror from one of the speakers about, uh, low carb diets. Um, the apocalypse will occur. Your child will, um, dissolve into a puddle of ketones. I mean, all because they're eating a healthy diet of meat and vegetables, basically protein foods and veggies and the occasional low carb treat and running normal blood sugars. And somehow this is gonna cause um, death and despair. Uh, meanwhile, the A1Cs are rising. Um, there's a new obesity crisis in type one children from uh, what is reported by Jocelyn to be the strategy of eat what you want and cover. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a disaster. And yet the, uh, the kids who are doing well and not like everyone else are such a mystery uh, to the endocrinologists. I would, I can guess that they suspect they, they suspect that they might be sending all their other patients down the tubes, and that sort of conflict um, sets them against the patients who are doing well. It would be much easier for them psychologically to not have to face the fact that they've been giving wrong information and hurting people. So that's what they do. They, for the most part, from what I, what I take into account, everything from um, bullying uh, for CPA. Look, I knew a guy yesterday, I talked to a guy that he was uh, gonna be reported to CPS for splitting his basal insulin. 
His child takes uh, three shots of Levamir a day, which is recommended by Bernstein and is a secret. So, I mean, I could not control a day's blood sugars without splitting basil and stuff. And yet he was threatened uh, with sending, uh, getting sent to CPS over that. So that's, that's much more typical than Dave's situation is the threats, mm. the bad information. It's a disaster, the situation, a disaster, right? And I'm looking for diabetes media or somebody to uh, step up and, and push back on this um, bad situation. So, yeah, uh, because I mean, it's, it's, it's hard enough to, to, I think, follow uh, a program that's going to lead to those results. I mean, in comparison to what most people are used to doing, let alone have to fight your doctor and, and fight uh, geez, state. Well, you're never going to get the information. Um, right. I would say that, uh, you know, I'll, I'll guess way more than half of doctors don't even know how to use insulin to cover protein or that insulin is required uh, to cover protein foods. They, they, in fact, this is, you, you find this free food comment, cheese is a free food, or even anything under 15 grams is a free food. So, I mean, you, you, for a parent to fight their way through the, all this nonsense, it is like the minefield. Right. You you need a, a special kind of person who can fight through all this. But one, one good thing is there are so many good examples now. If you go on diabetes media, I'm not talking about like the 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 the, the, the official diabetes media sites that are pharma funded. I'm talking about social media, grassroots media. Mm -hmm. You'll see the flat lines. You can talk to, you'll see them now. They're everywhere. You'll talk to the parents. What do you feed your kid? Well, it's not a really deprived diet. Here's some recipes. Here's some, my kid had pancakes this morning. They were just made with almond flour instead of, instead of grain. Um, they're, they're focused on higher protein foods, not glucose foods like uh, starches and, and junk food. And, and that's really all it is, is removing the foods which we now know are obesogenic, the junk foods, and keeping whole food. It's a whole foods diet, um, aside from some of the more natural foods like a potato, which is, which is, turns the glucose a little too fast to be covered by insulin. Basically, what you're doing is getting rid of processed food. That's it. And yet somehow the earth is, you know, coming to an end because uh, these kids aren't being overwhelmed with grocery store sheet cake. So, uh, but the word is getting out. What's your experience with uh, fruit consumption with Dave? Uh, obviously there's, most fruits contain quite a bit of sugar. It's usually okay. a, a mix of fructose and, and glucose, but, um, but you're still getting quite a bit of glucose in most fruits. So right. how do you, yeah, how do you, how do you work around that? Or work oh, okay. with we had this conversation with, uh, you know, like paleo God, Rob Wolf, I was on his podcast. Now Rob is, first of all, he's like 8% body fat. He does Brazilian jujitsu for hours a day. I mean, the dude is in shape and he, he eats some berries, you know? And uh, the point is that, there's a low carb community, which is big, and it's centered around weight loss and type two diabetes. And, and also because of food addiction, and we know that high carb foods in, uh, excite neurologic activity and the physiology of high carb processed foods are no good. But the reason a type one, and, and so Rob will eat a banana, uh, I don't know if he eats a banana, maybe I, he's gonna get mad at me now, but he'll eat some berries and stuff like that. The problem with a type one eating fruit, you know, Dave eats a banana or whatever, is not like there's some nutritional problem necessarily with that. The problem is that me mechanistically, mechanically matching insulin to high glucose foods is impossible. Like I was talking about earlier, it's a stochastic process. So if you eat a banana, you, weigh, like, you play the game where you weigh the banana. Okay, then you inject some insulin to cover it. The process has enough random variables in it. Um, and Bernstein talks about the whole deal in the book. But it, uh, so I won't get into all the, but there's a litany of reasons why it won't work. What that results in, again, is the sharp peak of the banana won't match up 
to the sharp peak and the insulin and the roller coaster starts. And now, now you've got to, for the price of this banana, which is mostly, you know, glucose and fiber and some water, for the price of that banana, you've got to not only endure a spike, but you've got to spend your next four hours trying to get your blood sugars back down and flat again. So it's, it's, the, it's not the, the low carb um, issue for type two, which has got its own set of important reasons. But with the type one injecting insulin, the main reason we have to follow a low carb diet is because of the mechanics of, of injecting insulin and matching to foods. So given that, it's an extremely fortuitous situation that it turns out, this is sort of the miracle of low carb, that the foods that we have to give up if we want to get the steady flat line um, are not required nutritionally. So what does Dave eat? He eats all meals lead with protein. He's a young, growing athlete. Kids need a ton of protein. What else does he eat? He eats vegetables and a variety of vegetables. So he eats meat and veg, man, just like grandma told you to back in the day. Eat your meat and veg, right? We lost that phrase. And then uh, there's no deprivation in the diet. Um, Dave has um, and probably needs some of these low carb snacks. Like he'll, my, my favorite um, dessert is, and everybody in the family is this uh, check out um, Maria Emrich and check out Carolyn Ketchum. Carolyn Ketchum has a recipe for uh, low carb poke cake, which is like the best cake I ever had. You, you, you trade wheat uh, for almond flour. Almonds taste better than, you know, seed grass anyway. Um, or grass, the, the seeds of grasses, which is what wheat is. So really, uh, once you get the cooking down, um, there's no deprivation. So uh, nutritionally, it's a win, and blood sugar-wise, it's a win. And if you if you follow the book, um, you know, um, emphasize protein with kids, learn how to use insulin to cover these foods. Um, it's all in the book. There's really nowhere to go but the book. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, you know, one of the reasons that I wanted to do this segment, the diabetes champion segment is, is just like you said before, uh, there's lots of stories uh, on diabetes, social media about people who have been able to get in control of their blood sugar, have been able to be successful uh, using uh, the approach like you guys use and others to, uh, you know, to find success. And, and the, the mental and emotional factor, I think, is uh, huge, you know, when you're able to, like you said, uh, eliminate that fear and to, to really get back, into, back in control or, and, and, or maybe get in control for the, for the first time. And I think we need to spread this message. People need to hear these stories because a lot of people have lost hope, uh, whether it's uh, through their experience medically or through their experience trying different diets and things, they've lost hope and they need to hear stories like yours so that they can find that hope again. Um, yeah. And again, not easy, uh, but this is something that can be done and, uh, and you're, you're showing that it can be done with a, with a 14 year old boy, which is uh, probably, I think maybe one of the hardest populations to, uh, to influence a diet oh. with. And obviously Dave is, is, uh, has played a huge role in that. Um, but, uh, but I think the, the kids are, the kids are sold short. You know, these, these kids don't want to go down the tubes. These kids are studying for, they're, they're doing sports. They're studying for college. Um, but they've never been told, you know, we, we did it. We did a poll in type one grit Sunday. Last time I checked it, the results were 180 to four. And the question was, has your doctor, when you were diagnosed, told you about high carb diets or low carb diets? Which diet to follow? High carb diets, 180 to four. I haven't checked in a few hours. It shouldn't change. And low carb diets, only four people. So like I said, it's the, if, you, if you don't find this message in social media, you don't go get the book or watch the, the Bernstein videos on YouTube. Um, 
you're going to be doing this all day and thinking you're doing the right thing. Um, and that's no way to live. Uh, it's, it's not, a, <laughs> it's not a, a system for long-term survival. It's, it's a system for diabetic complications and um, uh, some significant agony along the way. These kids get gastroparesis, they get retinopathy, they have, now we know they have uh, damage to the brain, developing brain, um, and all that can be avoided. Well, I would love to have you back to, uh, to do really a full podcast. I think we should talk all about the, the steps that you've extracted out of uh, Dr. Bernstein's book and the other things that you've learned uh, that you use to really ideally control uh, blood sugar. And I'd also love to talk more about uh, the study that uh, used ty the type 1 great group and um, uh, the pediatric study that talked all about uh, the yeah. amazing uh, benefits, you know, of, of following a, a low carb approach and then all the other things that are involved with that, uh, that come out of Dr. Bernstein's books and, and the, uh, the other work that you've done. So uh, we should, uh, we should have you back, uh, really do a, do a full podcast on a how to, because I think people will really love that information. That would be great. I'd love to do it. I'm in. All right. So, uh, well, I hope this uh, inspires you guys. Um, I know this, uh, Dave's obviously type one and, um, you know, maybe many people watching this have type two, but I think if you uh, uh, just uh, expand the way you look at this a little bit, you'll see that everything we talked about today can apply as well. Uh, maybe it's just a little bit of a different um, filter, but uh, all of this information, the, the reason I, I like uh, talking to you and I, I like looking at at um, people with case uh, type one as case studies because it's uh, it's it's a much more sensitive um, meter so to speak and I think the same principles can be applied to anybody who wants good blood sugar control and and uh, and uh, and insulin signaling and hormone balance and so forth uh, right. so so we just have to take that information and apply it and 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 you can do it uh, so thanks for uh, for being here with me RD and thanks for uh, being part of this uh, this new Diabetes Champions uh, podcast. Yeah, thank you very much. And um, your podcast is great. I listened to Marty Kendall yesterday, who's a, like a hero of mine. Uh, keep up the good work, Brian. This is important stuff. And um, I'll, I'll do anything to help you get your message out. Fantastic. I appreciate it. Thank you. And uh, for all of you watching, thanks for uh, checking out this episode as well. And uh, we'll be back next week with another uh, Diabetes Champions, and check out our Mastering Blood Sugar episode coming up here soon as well. Thanks, everybody. And uh, this is Dr. Brian Mole, the Diabetes Coach. We'll see you back next time. Uh, we'll be back next week with another expert interview.